Hello and welcome to Lunchtime Politics on Channels Television. I'm Millicent Walker. On the news this hour, leader of the Islamic movement of Nigeria, Sheikh Ibrahim El Zekzeki, lands India for medical treatment after court granted him leave to take care of his health. And the IMN leader's lawyer, Mr. Femi Falana, is happy with Mr. El Zekzeki's leave for medical treatment, and he's asking President Buhari and the federal government to obey other orders of court. And the governor of Edo State, Godwin Obasaki, has visited the APC national chairman in Edo State amidst the political rifts between the two men. Welcome everyone to the program and it is with news of the battle leader of the Islamic movement in Nigeria, IMN, Sheikh Ibrahim El Zekzeki and that of his wife Zenit that we commence this noon bulletin. We can now tell you that they are in daily India where they are expected to undergo medical treatment. According to the IMN spokesman Ibrahim Musa, El Zekzeki and his wife made a stopover at Dubai's international airport at about 4 a.m. this morning and uh, they were expected to arrive in India early, about 2.30 p.m. local time, but they have now. Uh, but here's a short video clip of the Shah Zida being driven on a wheelchair at the Namdiya Zikiwe International Airport in Abuja uh, before his departure on Monday. Also, you would, I'm sure you would all also see pictures of the Shiite leader, uh, which thereafter surfaced with him sitting comfortably in the aircraft uh, uh, on, from Namdiya Zikiwe International Airport. Sheikh Ibrahim El Zekzeki and his wife Zenit are to undergo medical treatment at the Mendata Hospital in India. The medical trip follows the order of the Kaduna State High Court, which granted El Zekzeki and his wife leave to go undergo treatment abroad. They are being accompanied by officials of the Kaduna State Government and personnel of the Department of State Services, DSS. The court also said that the IMN leader must return immediately after treatment to face his charges. Well, the chairman of the Free El Zekzeki movement also expressed his gratitude to the judiciary for ensuring that this first phase of their campaign was granted. We are really happy uh, today because all what we have been agitating for almost one and a half years now uh, that the Sheikh should be given access to have uh, medical treatment of his own choice, not the one chosen to hear for him by the state. Uh, but with the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, today at about 6 p.m., the Sheikh. Uh, flew out of Nigeria with an Emirates uh, flight to Dubai. He's taking him to New Delhi via Dubai. So we hope that he goes there safely so as to start his medical leave as granted by the Kaduna State High Court. Uh, this shows the independence of the judiciary because initially the bail application filed by uh, Mr. Femi Falana was turned down by the Kaduna State High Court. And, but relentlessly, uh, Chief Falana now requests that the judge should use his own position so as to see that Sheikh Zakzaki has been given chance to live, to have medical treatment of his own choice. In the meantime, lawyer to Sheikh Ibrahim El Zekzeki, senior advocate of Nigeria and rights activist Mr. Femi Falana, he has been reacting to the leave granted by the court for his client and his wife to travel to for medical treatment. Well, I wish the couple, uh, that is uh, Sheikh El Zekzeki and his wife, 
with speedy recovery in Libya. But I do hope uh, the government will have learned some lessons in this case, and that is the need to embrace the rule of law. In the first place, I would like to thank John uh, Justice Darius Kobo, who, as the, who is a Daniel, come to judgment in this case. His intervention, his intervention, his lordship's intervention has down tension in the country. Uh, the couple, I mean, Ezra Kizaki and his wife, uh, for medical reports, are really facing very serious crisis, a uh, health crisis uh, that doctors have won will lead to uh, their death if they are not taken care of on time. So, hope that in some lesson have been learned in that respect. The second one that's more important is the need for the government to continue, I mean, to take an opportunity to learn lessons from this case and then begin to comply with court orders and bow to the rule of law. Uh, whereas the sheriffs were not bothered by the prescription of the Islamic movement of Nigeria. In other words, in spite of the prescription, they continue to protect on tricks in Abuja. But with the intervention of the Cardinal State High Court, whereby the order for their leader and his wife to travel abroad for medical treatment was granted, uh, they no longer saw the need to continue to demonstrate on the street in Abuja. So, by the decision of the government to obey the order of the court, uh, the Shiites also decided uh, uh, to put an end to street protests. Well, Mr. Fallon now also reacted to the possibility of Mr. El Zekzaki returning to the tension after the medical treatment since the order was for him and his wife to go for medical treatment. Well, you know, if you look at it, I do, again, I do hope that the entire case uh, will be reviewed. I think, I think these people afford the government the opportunity to review the entire case. In the first place, uh, if the government tries to proceed with the case, uh, of course, the Ezaki are willing to stand trial and clear their names. Uh, it is important for Nigerians to know that the charge brought against them arose last year when government wanted to legitimize their further detention, whereas the federal High Court had granted them, I mean, I declared their detention illegal uh, in December 2016. For two years, the order was not obeyed. What then happened last year was that it was becoming embarrassing that the, uh, the shares were demonstrating, asking the waging a moral battle against the government by asking the government to obey the order of the court. It was at that stage that the government said, what do we do? Let us go and tag them. They are charged, they are currently facing the, the charge of inciting people to kill a soldier. We have evidence that they didn't kill a soldier. Those who were charged, about 300 people, about 200 people were charged with killing the same soldier. Not less than 180 of them have been charged and acquitted. So if you say I inspired people to uh, kill, and the court has said they didn't kill, I mean, you know, the, the charge is neither here nor there. But as I said, they are ready to face the trial. They are ready to clear their names, so there's no problem. But with respect to their detention, again, there is a crisis. There is a conflict between the order of the Federal High Court and the order of the Cardinal State High Court. But I don't want to go into the details of that for now. What bothered me, what was important for me, was to get them to go for medical treatment because they need to be allowed to stand trial. Once they are ready, once they are ready, crisis is just off, then we are now going to challenge their further detention. Whether the order of the 
Kaduna State High Court has cancelled the order of the Federal High Court, you know, uh, that would be the next case. I mean, the next issue to address. Well, now let's take a look at the journey of Sheikh El Zakzaki, his detention, the issues raised, and how his trip uh, to India, looking at how it all, when it all actually started. And that's looking back at 2015, December the 14th to be precise. The Ayman leader and his wife were arrested in Zaria following a clampdown on Shiites by the Nigerian army. And that, of course, leads to September, where the Kaduna State Judicial Commission of Inquiry recommended prosecuting of soldiers involved in the Zaria killings. The 2nd of December 2016, Zekzaki ordered to be released from DSS detention into police custody within 45 days. The 24th of the same year and the same month, uh, the Shias defied the Kaduna government holding rallies demanding the release of the IMN leader. In 2017, January, the Obey the Court order released El Zekzaki's wife, Amnesty International, told the Nigerian government. And the following year, the Shia leader made his first public appearance since 2015. On the 22nd of January 2019, they both headed to the Kaduna High Court for hearing on another bill application. And of course, the House of Representatives weighed in July the 10th, 2019, telling the federal government to release him. In uh, July, we had several protests of the IMN group, and there was a major clash with the Nigerian police. The 5th of August 2019, the Kaduna Court granted him and his wife leave to travel for medical treatment. But the following day, the Kaduna state government filed terms for strict supervision of the medical leave and granted the Islamic cleric and his wife uh, at the Kaduna High Court. And we know what's happened yesterday, between yesterday and today uh, that the IMA leaders landed daily in India to be taken to hospital for treatment. Well, let's get some legal views on this and his detention. And, of course, uh, the leave of court for the medical treatment. Joining us in the studio is Mr. Evans Afredi, a legal practitioner. Thank you for coming. Good afternoon. All right. So um, what do you make of this? Uh, you heard his lawyer say he's quite happy with this, and he's saying that it shows the independence of the judiciary to you. Do you think it's success for justice? Well, it's success for justice because... Um the only way that a government can safeguard its legitimacy is to play by the rules of the law. The rule of law supersedes uh, every other kind of uh, proposition, as government uh, will have it done. Uh, the said uh, uh, defendant have been in custody since 2015. And then uh, in December 2nd, 2016, the court uh, asked that it be granted bail. What since then? The federal government have declined, and that in itself has really shown that uh, the uh, decision of government, okay, as regards human rights in Nigeria, is becoming overbearing, okay. And then a government must guard against this. I mean, uh, what we have now is not bail. The application for bail was granted by the court. The government have refused to obey it. What we have now is a leave of court which the lawyer brought under uh, the rules, the prison uh, rule, you know, for which uh, so he was able to get many this. Many people have been asking, you know, so under what is the, the government operating now? I mean, people are saying, I mean, it's not, you said the government didn't grant bail, even though the court um, had granted bail before. So um, at what point would you say maybe even the court has granted leave but not bail? How are they operating is it according to the rules? Do we have to go into the argument of national security and citizens' rights? You see, the question of national security, like the president said some time ago, that uh, it supersedes everything. National security is subject to the rule of law. We must get this right. But if you look at the Constitution in Chapter 4, the Constitution has made inbuilts and parameter for which national security can be defended. Okay, if you look at Section 33, for example, of the 1999 Constitution, I talk about the right to life. Okay, that right to life is not absolute. Okay, where a person has committed an offense, and the penalty for that offense is death penalty, and the person must be tried. Okay, he must go through trial. He must be convicted for that offense and be sentenced accordingly. And it is only at that point that his right to life can be denied of him. That, those are the, the exceptions inbuilt in the Constitution to guarantee national security, which is also a path through to the rule of law. 
Okay? So, but where government discard all this, okay, and then begin to operate in, you know, a kind of uh, tax that is unknown to our law, then it behoves of us to call the government to order. Okay, but right we'll now, it's selective uh, 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 court order that the government we'll uh, decides come, We'll to come back order. to your thoughts on that and continue, but we need to take a break now. And when we return, also, in view of the International Youth Day, which was yesterday, uh, we're asking what's the stake of the Nigerian youth in Nigerian governance and politics. We'll bring you details when we return. Back everyone to the program and we still have in the studio Mr. Evan Tufeli. He is a legal practitioner. We've been taking a look at some of the legal views on the lead by the Kaduna uh, court granted to the IMN leader who is in India for medical treatment and his wife. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, Many people are also wondering about the fundamental human rights and how courts actually interpret such rules when, you know, lawyers go before them. And a few of them have criticized it, said it's, it's really been unclear. And some of the cases we've seen in the past, still present, not even this one, um, also, you know, throw a point to that. But looking at this leave granted, some people say it's a step uh, in, in the right direction, even though many people have questioned some of the conditions of that leave, saying, you know, it's not quite clear to a, a lot of people but what do you see happening playing out um, in the coming days maybe when they return yeah, what will play out is that um, it is expected based on the order that it is a leave to go for medical treatment and after that they have to return federal government has also taken further steps to make sure that they sign uh, what we call uh, uh, a guarantee, okay, irrevocable guarantee with the Indian government not to grant him asylum or through a third party decide to do that in the guise of uh, presenting himself as a, a, a political, uh, you know, uh, uh, and all that. So the, the position right now is that it is good that the, the government has obeyed the court order because that is a step forward. It puts our democracy together. It gives even the international community the only way to understand that perhaps this government also have the capacity to listen to the court and then follow court order. But I think that uh, on the part of the defendant, the, part, the defendant must also comport himself, both of them, they must act based on the conditions okay, that have been given concerning this because that is part of the court order. So if, they, if we commend the government or if they also commend the government to have, you know, obey the court or that they, they too must play by the rules and keep their, uh, 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 their part to this same order. Condition. And that is the only way that we can, because if you now go further and begin to violate the order, government will have a justification, okay, for the long uh, 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 disobe disobedience of court order that it has been known for for the past uh, few years as regards this particular case in question. All right. We'd we'll like to appreciate your time, uh, Evan Sufeli, for joining us on Long-Term Politics. It appears the rift between the governor of Edo State, Mr. Gordon Obasaki, and the national chairman of the All Progressives Congress may be on a path of reconciliation. This is because the governor is set to have paid a visit to the home of the national chairman yesterday in Iyamo in Edo State. Now, the governor was said to have gone there with some members of his cabinet and some party chieftains where informal chats took place. It is not clear if the two men held any closed-door conversation or discussion of ways to resolve the crisis rocking the Edo State House of Assembly. Uh, we hear that the 30 to about 45 minutes visit of Governor Basaki and his crew was set to have ended with cheers and laughter from the two parties. There has been a debate, by the way, and this is over the performance of the Buhari-led government and the first term and the next level agenda the All Progressives Congress has for the second term. Now, Mr. Joey Bokwe and Mr. Ken Okulubo, they were both guests on our political program and they held different views on the performance and also plans of the Buhari-led government. Uh, Mr. Ibokwe, a spokesperson for the APT in Lagos, and uh, Mr. Okulubo, uh, 
political scientist, a member of the People's Democratic Party. Take a listen to what each of them had to say. Talking about the fact that he wants to step up, you know, from where, you know, you know, you don't have to move forward. So I think that's what he's talking about. He's going to move probably faster and be strong-willed in doing the needful. So don't go that side. It's not say it's not it's not giving up. <laughs> he's just telling you that he knows where he's going, and he's going to get there. And when somebody's going, going to say he's going to do his best, it means optimum. Getting to the highest level, the man cannot fail. And the man can be trusted. It's a matter of trust. There are people who said we're not going to trust over the keys of our national treasuries again, given our past experiences. There are things that we're supposed to do in the midst of plenty that we did not do. That's what we're suffering. Anybody who tells you that Buhari is not doing well is a liar from the pit of hell. I've tried to always be objective, but Ibukri must agree. We are hungry. Nigerians are hungry. The economy is bad. Even President Buhari has accepted that the economy is not healthy. Our GDP is going be below 2.0% now, if the, apart from what the World Bank projected, that we're going to increase to about 2.8 or 2.9%. Our inflation rate is still double digits. The misery index is increasing. The empire, 500,000 people that they promised us, is not up to 500,000. Three million was what they said in 2015. They, were, they reached a benchmark of 500,000. The school feeding program is not going on in more than 20 states or 21 states, and it's not cons consistent. The president must accept when, it's, when you have constructive criticism. It's not every criticism you must throw away. Yesterday was the International Youth Day. Young people within the ages of uh, about 18 to 35 years, they're classified as the youth. In the past in Nigeria, there have been advocacy for youth inclusion in the democratic and political process. In the last election, there was a huge talk about youth participation, but how did they fare? Let's talk to one of the advocates of the Not Too Young to Run campaign, Mr. Samson Itoda. He joins us now via Skype. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us. We just have a few minutes uh, to talk about this. Um, but I must ask, I mean, young people have been empowered. Um, I mean, one can say that with that law. But what do you think is really the major impediment to youth participation in politics in Nigeria? Well, there are several factors that I get against um, youth participation in politics. Uh, some are economical, uh, political, also cultural, as well as legal. Um, you look at one of the structural influences and cultural from Bill Sucks to press, he does a large extent. Oh dear, it appears we're having a bad connection with that. Uh, we appear to have lost him, but I did hope we could talk some more about this, uh, seeing that uh, a lot of people have, have talked about um, young people and their participation. Uh, what you can see uh, there is really how they had fed, and this is according to research done uh, by uh, Samson Itodo and his um, firm. They, they established that over the number of people, and that's over 84 million people that registered, about 52.86% of them were male and 47.14% of them were female. And the registration by age group show um, 15.2% were the elderly, but then looking at young people, a huge number, 51.11%. What you can see are indeed uh, some of the different areas um, that you can see are the colors there, uh, yellow for North Central and the others. But I think we have Samson right now. And if you can quickly conclude uh, on that point with regards to um, some of the impediments and really the solution moving forward, seeing that we're approaching 2023. Well, we've got an opportunity to reform our electoral um, system. Um, and so the National Assembly is still accelerating the process of, of amending the electoral act in the process. We need to reduce the cost of politics. Um, it just prepares us the amount of monies that teams charge to date, as well as it's really on a and we put on our electoral system on this um, monetary that our political parties have set. 
The second is parties need to invest in internal parties. All right. Well, Samson, we'd like to really thank you um, for, for that short time, and we really need to go. But I know a lot of people are also saying we also need, most importantly, competent, credible young people uh, in politics. Well, thank you, and thank you all for watching. That's how we wrap things up here. Don't forget, join the conversation on our social media platforms. I'm Millicent Walker. I'll see you soon.